So people of African descent have made considerable contributions to the culture and society of the United States, yet their achievements are often downplayed, if not entirely hidden from popular memory. In some cases, this has been done deliberately for economic or political reasons, such as when vibrant African-American communities were maligned as dangerous or unsavory so they could be cleared for urban renewal. And a recent manifestation of deliberate disenfranchisement, dis, disenfranchisement from history is, was seen just last year when a, when a United States congressman stated on a national broadcast that, quote, non-whites, unquote, had contributed nothing to civilization. So, of course, this isn't true, and there are numerous examples of African and African-American contributions to non-African societies. Nevertheless, stereotypes about African-American activities, behaviors, and contributions to the U.S. are persistent and persistently negative. So, how do I advance it? The, the, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, that one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So in this, in this paper, I suggest that archaeology can provide modern African-American communities with information about the activities of their ancestors, as well as ammunition to counter stereotypes. Although archaeology is not essential for this, it can provide tangible examples to local and regional communities of their various accomplishments and, the, and their time depth. Or as Christopher, Christopher Fennell put it uh, recently, archaeology can reveal evidence of past vitalities that aid heritage claims of present communities, quote unquote. I'm going to discuss two examples of African American life in the southeastern United States where archaeology can help descendant communities see and understand the place in history. Both examples come from the coastal plantation regions of the Carolinas and Georgia. During the 18th century, this region became one of the richest British colonial areas, and it continued to prosper after the American Revolution. Uh, at the, the agricultural success was founded on tidal rice cultivation along the region's largest river systems. River rice gave rise to the plantation societies that dominated this district during most of the 18th and 19th centuries and established social and economic conditions that had lasting impacts after the end of slavery and into the present. Rice requires periods of inundation while it grows, and in the Carolinas and Georgia, plantations using tidal irrigation relied on systems of canals and dikes to control water flow in and out of the fields. They harnessed tidal action to flood the fields through special gates or, or trunks, they were, as they were called, that were activated when the tide flowed into the rivers, raising freshwater levels high enough to enter the trunks. When it was time to flood the fields, the gate at the riverside was raised in the open position to allow water to flow into the field. The gate on the field side swung open from the water pressure and then closed automatically and was held in place by the pressure in the opposite direction when the water reached the desired level. To drain the fields, the trunks were opened at the field side and at low, at low tide, and the process worked in reverse. Tidal rice cultivation required extensive earthworks, canals, subcanals, and other alterations of the lower river terraces and floodplains. The labor for this work, from clearing the extensive marshes and cypress swamps that initially dominated the river valleys to building the entire infrastructure that produced rice, was performed by hand by enslaved people of African descent. So what needs to be emphasized is that the construction and operation of productive rice fields took more than hard physical labor. It involved considerable knowledge, skill, and technical expertise. Furthermore, tidal rice cultivation techniques in the southeastern North America were evidently adapted from African precedents, as Judith Carney has shown, and modified for the large-scale production and processing uh, that was characteristic of uh, plantations. West Africans were familiar with the cultivation of numerous varieties of rice, and this experience made African laborers from the rice-growing regions attractive to planters in the Carolinas and Georgia. In fact, the gates used to flood the, and drain the fields were called trunks because of the African practice of using hollowed-out trees for this purpose. Rice cultivation in the region never recovered after the American Civil War and generally faded around the turn of the 20th century. Despite the passage of time, the signs of rice agriculture remain on the landscape. A detailed study of tidal rice landscapes in the Winya Bay region of South Carolina demonstrated that former rice growing regions still convey a sense of their function and historic associations. Low country rice landscapes included a mixture of tidal swamp converted for cultivation and, high, and adjacent high ground where the plantation and rice handling areas were established. These complexes contained the facilities necessary for processing, packing, and shipping rice, planters' houses, slave quarters, and general farm buildings. The housing and rice processing facilities tended to be concentrated within the individual plantations 
in locations that overlooked the extensive rice fields that dominated the river terraces and floodplains. The most prominent remains of these fields, which are still common in the landscape, are the networks of channels, canals, levees, and embankments reflecting the old irrigation systems that cross-cut most of the wetlands along the major rivers. The prevalence of these features contributes to the distinct quality of the region that is clear in modern maps and aerial photographs. In some cases, the embankments along the main river channel have been maintained along with the field side ditches so that the floodplains remain useful for cultivation. <laughs> it doesn't look like my normal computer. Thank you. <laughs> um, Uh, so, so the floodplains are still in use for um, cultivation and often for wetlands uh, and, and wildlife preserves. Um, where the canals have been retained for irrigation and drainage, water is admitted inside the embankments with trunks built in the traditional style. And these are all modern examples, um, but they look exactly like the, the traditional ones. Um, although they're not in pristine condition, the region's rice fields reflect historical techniques and land use patterns to maintain them and keep them operating. They also reflect a clear human creation and permanent alteration of the physical environment as their construction involved the removal of the natural cypress gum forests and interruption of plant succession so that now these areas remain as grassy marshes. The present day low country landscapes thus reflect the expertise, knowledge, skill, and labor of people of African descent. It can be stated categorically that this community produced distinctive and significant landscapes which have had lasting effects on the appearance and character of the region. Um, the second topic I want to cover relates to the economic activities of enslaved African Americans in this region. Research into this area indicates that the slaves were skilled and energetic entrepreneurs. Were skilled and, and energetic entrepreneurs. Despite the restrictions of slavery, they created a vigorous internal economy apart from the formal and official economy of the region. The existence of the internal economy. Uh, contradicts stereotypes about their initiative, knowledge, and abilities, and shows that where there were opportunities open to them, African Americans were fully capable of, pros of prospering and building lives for themselves. The slave's economic life was partly a byproduct of the task labor system. Task labor was an arrangement where planters or their agents assigned slaves a particular work objective to accomplish each day, and once it was finished, slaves could use their time as they wished. This system allowed them opportunities for gardening and other food procurement like fishing or hunting, animal husbandry, craft work, or other activities. Historians have indicated that slaves worked in a tremendous range of areas and were quite savvy about acquiring wealth and currency or property. In fact, when federal troops began to occupy the Low Country during the Civil War and Northern administrators started dealing with the newly emancipated African Americans, they expected to have to teach them economic basics, among other knowledge, um, or among other elements of citizenship, but were surprised to find that they were already extremely experienced and knowledgeable in, in these matters. The range of enterprises that slaves are known to or could have engaged in to earn incomes was extensive. These included selling produce, domestic animal products, wild foods, skins, operating ferries, trucking and hauling, pottery making, and other craft work such as basket making, collecting and selling firewood, collecting Spanish moss for stuffing furniture, and many other things. Uh, slaves sold their products through various outlets. Planters often purchased produce from their own slaves, either to use on their own plantation or to sell on their behalf. Slaves also sold merchandise directly at the region's urban and town markets, which was a method that planters never could stop, even though they tried. Another practice was to sell to neighboring planters and farmers directly or to passing travelers who needed provisions and horse feed. While historians have documented the internal economy, archaeological interpretations of this network might underestimate the economic lives of enslaved African Americans. This may be partly a result of the ephemeral quality of relevant archaeological remains. Uh, for example, uh, evidence of collecting and selling fire, firewood would be difficult to see archaeologically. So where this issue has been received the most attention, it tends to focus on tangible materials such as colonial ware ceramics, which leave traces in the archaeological assemblages in which archaeologists have explored in some detail with respect to their commercial context. Another reason that slaves' economic activities might be underrepresented in archaeological studies is because the relevant artifacts are interpreted from the standpoint of trying to fit them into, quote, traditional views of the hardship of slavery, 
or put another way, it could be that artifacts are inter interpreted from the perspective that they function primarily in a context of near impoverishment, bare survival, and hard scrabble self-sufficiency. So for example, an animal trap recovered from a slave settlement on St. Simon's Island, Georgia, was interpreted as subsistence related, an expression and an expression of slaves trying to make up deficiencies in the rations that planters gave them. If you put this artifact in another context, however, it can be viewed as a tool for catching game meat and skins for sale. In this scenario, the trap reflects a broader economic system. And the same can be said for artifacts associated with fishing and other types of hunting. Um, similarly, uh, many of the items related to uh, clothing and sewing that may be found in slave settlements can be seen as components of their internal economy. African American women were accomplished in needle arts, like white women at this time. In fact, while planters gave male, ra male slaves rations of clothes, they gave female slaves uh, a cloth ration and, and an, all an annual allocation of needles and expected them for, to manufacture their own clothes. Um, they used these skills not just to dress themselves and their families, but also to make a variety of other items, including sheets, pillowcases, quilts, which African American women became uh, renowned for, um, and possibly other housewares. And obviously, these kinds of products could be made for sale as well as home use. Other artifacts would be more difficult to interpret without reference to the slave's internal economy. These include um, possible curry comb and horse bridle that were recovered from a site near Savannah, Georgia. Um, when considering slaves' economic activities, these kinds of artifacts have clear functions in the context of a slave. They, they don't actually have, um, have uh, clear functions in the context of a slave household. But um, as historian Dylan Penningroth studied property among low country slaves, he discovered an extensive ownership and trade in horses. Further, slaves could earn income as draymen and carters, which would require possession of at least one draft animal. So in this context, in this other context of looking in the economy of their internal economy, the discovery of horse tack, along with various utilitarian buckles that could reflect harnesses, saddles, and other equipment, illustrate an aspect of slaves and freed people's economic activities that might be overlooked if, if um, you were just looking at, at them from a standpoint of domestic activities. The history of African Americans is increasingly well understood, but as I noted at the beginning of this paper, there's a perception that their contributions to the history of this region was mainly in their labor. Examination of the rice landscapes and the small finds at their residential sites emphasizes the skill, knowledge, effort, and talent that people of African descent brought to the United States. In the case of the rice fields, it can be said that the low country landscape was literally created by African Americans, and not only by their physical labor, but also by the technical knowledge and skills they brought to the cultivation of this particular crop. The landscape can still be seen and understood. With respect to the slaves' internal economy, looking at artifacts in this broader context provides tangible evidence of what northern educators discovered when they arrived in the low, in the low country, that the local communities already had expertise in the market economy and were quite sophisticated about operating in it. So therefore, archaeology has a strong potential to show the contributions of African Americans to the creation and growth of the United States. Archaeology provides tangible examples of these people's lives and their work and their skills and experiences. While African Americans have frequently been disenfranchised in discussions of United States history, the examples I discussed here demonstrate that they have always been dynamic and active players in the growth of the country, and their contributions entitle them to, to participate in narratives of the country's history and heritage as equal partners. Thank you.